Hello, everybody. I wanted to uh, provide sort of an update on the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard trial. So as you guys know, if you are subscribed to my Substack, um, I have been covering the trial. I've been attending here in person in Fairfax County, Virginia. But the thing is, you know, I had started writing like daily write-ups for it, but it's going to be such a long event and uh, it's such an all day like thing. I'm getting up at five o'clock in the morning to get there at like 7 a.m. to wait in line to get a limited number of wristbands. And then the trial itself doesn't start until 10 a.m. And then you're there all day until uh, after five o'clock. Then when I come home, I have another show to do from seven to nine. So it's just too much stuff for me to try to write up something about a daily plus there are other channels that are doing uh, daily coverage of this. There are people who are picking up the live stream from um, Court TV, I think, is uh, streaming it. Law & Cuck is also streaming it. But there are channels like Legal Bites, um, Ricada Law. There are a bunch of other channels that are doing, like, daily live streaming of it. So if you want to watch it, those are the channels to watch. Um, they go live, I think, every single day. They carry it. Um, and so that's who you want to watch. I think also some of these channels uh, are doing sort of like daily recaps. So if you're interested in that kind of information, you can get that information there. There is no shortage of people that are talking about the trial and covering it. Um, so what I wanted to do is just provide basically the information that you wouldn't be able to get from watching those live streams and tuning into those channels. Um, I recommend the LawTube community's coverage of it just because they have a, a good, um, a good grasp on the legal issues there and they can give good commentary and analysis on things like that. So I recommend that. I know they're doing recaps and stuff as well if you don't want to watch the entire, like, however many hours it is each day. Uh, so I recommend doing that. But what I wanted to provide is just the perspective from being inside the courtroom and maybe the things that you wouldn't see unless you were there in person. So um, my first four articles were covering the first uh, four days of the trial. We are now up on to, I think, the um, maybe the 10th or 11th day at this point. The days are just bleeding together. Uh, but right now, it is Friday. There was no uh, court today. It, it, trial resumes Monday morning. So I just wanted to kind of talk about certain things, beginning with uh, day five from my notes here. That was the day that I met the gentleman from Darth News. Uh, this is somebody who is another YouTuber. Uh, I think he's somebody that is pro Johnny Depp, um, very clearly, has been covering this stuff for a long time. So he knows probably a lot of the details that maybe I wouldn't know or people wouldn't know unless they've been following it for a very long time. I also met another YouTuber there uh, named Dr. Soup. She is also um, pro Johnny Depp. You can find her channel as well. I think she's also streaming uh, the, the trial. She attended in person a couple days, and then that was it. And then I think she's been streaming it on her channel. So beginning, excuse me, beginning on day five, um, as far as uh, what I was looking for was... Some of like the, I'm trying to get reads from the jury as certain people are testifying. Like we had the continuation of the testimony of Sean Bett, which is Johnny Depp's security. Then we had his sound technician, Keenan Wyatt. Now this guy was interesting. He's known Johnny Depp for over 25 years. He worked with him on over a dozen of his films. Um, but he is not employed by or being paid by Johnny Depp, although we did learn at one point that he um, had a relationship, I guess, with Johnny Depp's sister, uh, Christy Dombrowski. Um, and when that got brought up, you know, it was sort of like people were like, ooh, you know, <laughs> that was Amber's lawyers that brought that up. 
So as far as that goes, um, you know, it, it seemed like the, uh, it seemed like he was a good, um, witness, I think, for Johnny Depp. I remember, uh, people in the courtroom seem, seeming to like him, not as much as they liked Isaac Baruch, you know, and, uh, Johnny's testimony, you know, they weren't really, like, laughing along with this guy or anything like that, but I think he came off as credible, um, and sort of the, the way that he handled the cross-examination by Amber Heard's lawyers. I'm trying to see if there's anything in here that maybe you guys wouldn't know unless you were in the courtroom. I'm trying to go through my notes here. They talked about the earpiece and stuff like that that Johnny Depp would wear that would play, like, music um, to help him, like, get into character. I thought that was interesting. Um, yeah, and then Johnny Depp was the third witness that day. <laughs> oh, here, here's something that you wouldn't have known unless you were attending it in person that day. The day five was the day that, um, Amber's crazy fan or friend, uh, Christina Taft was escorted out by sheriffs from the fifth floor of the Fairfax County courtroom because she was being psychotic and she was trying to dox people that were in the audience um she was uh she was like taking she, i don't know how she was finding people's like twitter accounts and stuff or their social media but she was going up to like the sheriffs and she was trying to get them to like kick people out that were johnny depp supporters and um i guess they had had enough of her because Amber had another person, uh, Ava Bartlett, that was doing the same thing. And she is also was barred from the the courtroom. And um, after they did that, they started requiring people to show their uh, IDs every single day. And now you get a number on your wristband now that is tied to your ID. So now they've got your name and stuff like that. I thought that was a little strange, but that was something that happened. Um, trying to pay attention to the the judge's demeanor uh, during some of the stuff since you can't see her on camera for most of the time. But uh, for the most part, she doesn't really like react to a lot of this stuff. You know, she's not giving like facial expressions that show any kind of uh, like what she would be thinking or anything like that. Um, I think that Johnny Depp's testimony, which began on day five, mm -hmm. uh, was very very good um when he began talking about his uh childhood right his um uh, i guess you could say abusive and neglectful childhood he talked about his mother and how she treated him and his siblings um and as he was discussing this not only the whole courtroom but the jury as well they were all like sort of just fixated on him and the way that he was like describing this because um he had the time to sort of like walk through uh, the story there and talk about it. And I think that was something that was interesting for people it was the first time he took the stand, nobody had gotten to hear from him. And he said that uh, basically he had waited six years to tell his side of the story. Um, and he, he characterized Amber Heard's uh, allegations of domestic of DV and uh, DA and SA against him as uh, disturbingly criminal claims not based on any species of truth. I wrote that down. I thought that was a good quote. He said it just didn't need to go in that direction. There were arguments, but never did I ever strike Ms. Heard. Her accusations permeated through the industry, talking about Hollywood where he had worked for over 30 years, and he said, became a global fact, if you will, fact, quote, unquote. And he wanted to stand up for himself. He said his children were 14 and 16 at the time these allegations were made against him, and they were in high school, and this was something that affected them. They had kids that would come up to them with People Magazine and say things like, your, your dad's a wife beater, or something like that. He said that her lies kept multiplying and it kept getting bigger and bigger. It took on sort of a life of its own. So he wanted to clear his name for his children. I thought that was important. The jurors are taking notes and they watch Depp intently as he testifies. So that 
Uh, that was interesting. That that was something that I noticed because not all of the jurors, there are, um, there's like one who takes copious amounts of notes. There are a couple who occasionally take notes. But when Johnny Depp first took the stand on day five and began his testimony, they were all, they all started taking notes and were sort of watching him intently. And so I wanted to write that down. He said, quote, my goal is the truth, unquote because it killed me that people I had spoken to for years that I'd known and gotten to advise uh, would think that I was a fraud and that I had lied to them. He said he felt a responsibility to clear the record, um, and he had been waiting six years. Uh, he said, one minute you're Cinderella, the next you're Quasimodo. <laughs> He said he prided himself on honesty and truth, that he is obsessed with the truth and uh, that lies upon lies build on lies and that uh, they accomplish nothing. He said it was his first time to speak on this matter and he didn't want his kids to experience uh, paparazzi. He was always a very private person. So for him to come here uh, and have all of his personal information exposed, including um, his like medical information, uh, text messages, emails, things like this um, to his family. Uh, he said that he knows he is doing the right thing and that it's, you know, he's willing to do all of that in order to get the truth out there. He's, he characterized his childhood as very interesting. Uh, he said he thought it was normal up until a certain age. He was born in Kentucky. He said they moved constantly. They were always on the move. He was always sort of the new kid. They moved to South Florida when he was seven or eight. Um, his mother was unpredictable and could be cruel uh, with Debbie, Danny, and Christine. Those are his siblings as well as him and his father. He said she could become quite violent and cruel. She threw things like ashtrays. Uh, she beat someone with a shoe once or a phone. Um, he said he was never exposed to safety or security as a child, and he tried to stay out of the line of fire. The jurors look on intently with sympathy as Johnny Depp discusses childhood abuse, physical abuse, constant, a lot of verbal abuse, bullying, making fun of whatever defect one might have, uh, she called his brother Bucktooth and Four Eyes. His sister Christine was referred to as Violet because that was the grandmother's name and she didn't like the grandmother. Um, things like that. Johnny Depp had a lazy eye when he was a child and she called him cockeyed, one eye, um, to demean and humiliate him. He had to wear an eye patch in order to train his bad eye. Uh, he said there was verbal physical abuse. He said that the verbal abuse was almost worse than the beatings. The emotional abuse was what tore them up. Um, he said his father was a very kind man, quiet, shy, non-confrontational. Betty Sue is his mother. He said um, when she would go off on his dad, he would remain calm and very stoic. He took her abuse, basically. He said there was never really a moment where he lost control or attacked Johnny's mother. He said the most he would do would maybe punch a wall. Uh, one time he saw his father shatter his hand. He, he said that his dad remained a gentleman. He says as a five-year-old, he wondered, how does he take this? Why doesn't he leave? He said his dad was a good man and was never abusive to him or his siblings, but that his father was at the mercy of Betty Sue because if he argued with her, she would blow up. Sound familiar? He repeatedly refers to his mother as Betty Sue. He left school at 15 years old to play music. The dad um, parked uh, one day, packed up his things in his car and left. Betty Sue came home from work, looked around, and uh, said, your, your dad's gone. Um, his dad told him, I can't do it anymore. You're the man now. Mom went into a depression, tried to commit suicide. One juror's eyes go wide as Johnny Depp relays his mother's downward, downward spiral when she uh, went down to 70 pounds. As Johnny Depp talks, the whole courtroom is quiet, focused, and listening. 
learning he was very wrong about his father about his first impressions uh, regarding his dad's exit from the family. He learned how to raise children, uh, do the opposite of what Betty Sue did. He said, don't raise your voice, don't shout no to them, show them that they are options. That's how Johnny learned to be a parent, basically. More conversational, uh, not making threats to kids. He says in the beginning of his relationship, with Amber, she was as if she was too good to be true. That's your first red flag, Johnny. <laughs> One of many that you seemingly ignored. He said she was attentive, kind, funny, understanding, had things in common with him as far as music, literature, and things like that go. Um, I believe that is because she researched those things in advance before she met Johnny Depp. I think she knew exactly uh, what he things that he liked so she could present herself that way. Uh, he said for the first year and a half, the relationship was quote unquote amazing. Then he noticed a few small red flags. He would work a lot when he would come home. She would sit down and give him a glass of wine. She would take his shoes off. He said he had never experienced that before. That sort of um, attention, things like that. He said one day he came home, she was busy, he took his shoes off and she came in and she was upset and she said, what did you just do? That's my job. She was visibly upset that he had broken her rules of routine. He thought it was strange. Once he noticed that, he began to see a few more red flags, you think? Uh, after another year and a half, she became another person. Johnny Depp was filling out a job application in L.A. This is uh, when he was younger. Uh, when he first got to L.A., he met Nicolas Cage and said, Nicolas Cage said to him, why don't you meet my agent? Because I think you could be an actor. Nicolas Cage sent him to his agent. J.D. was sent to casting to read for Wes Craven's Nightmare on Elm Street, and he got the job. He found himself placed uh, on the road to be an actor. He was cast on 21 Jump Street, didn't consider himself an actor, but rather a musician. He found that fun. He's always been introverted and shy, so it was strange for him. He was uncomfortable with fame. He didn't like it, never wanted to be a lead singer or front man. He doesn't uh, think it's anything one can get used to. He said he had too much respect to become a teen idol, so he stayed away from music and began to study acting. He referred to this as sort of a trial by fire on the job training. He calls acting reacting and behavior throughout uh, that testimony. He said that he never felt like a real actor until the 1986 film Platoon when he was cast in that. Uh, he was cast in Pirates. Disney offered him uh, the film, a film called Hildago. He read the script. He didn't like it, didn't think it was for him. He said that he tried to incorporate parameters of cartoons into Captain Jack Sparrow to control the suspension of disbelief. He thought it, it would be a character embraced by people of all ages. So he thought it was a good opportunity for him to sort of um, play a role that would appeal to everybody. He first got the script in 2002. He said it had all the hallmarks of a predictable three-act structure. He made changes to the character, much to the chagrin of Disney initially. He based his Edward Scissorhands character on a dog that he had and his sister's newborn baby, a uh, newborn baby sort of reaction to the world um, as kind of seeing things for the first time, that sort of excitement, awe, innocence, purity, things like that. He said that uh, Amber was uh, visibly annoyed, uh, or I'm sorry, these are my notes, Amber looks visibly annoyed as Johnny Depp talks about pirates and she fiz fidgets in her seat that was inside the courtroom. Johnny Depp never watched pirates, according to him. I thought that was funny. He claims he knows Captain Jack better than the people who wrote the character because he made the character his own. The, the room occasionally laughs at Johnny Depp's words. After pirates came out, um, he had a different way of life. He says, that is to say that at our house in L.A., people would try to climb to get to see Captain Jack. They would come dressed up as Jack. 
Uh, he had to hire more security guards. He worried about his kids and getting followed by hordes of paparazzi. He says that you realize anonymity is gone and it is an odd thing to deal with. You can't just drive down to a diner and get a cup of coffee. You can't just take your kids to the park or a movie. It, it has to become this, this thing that gets planned out, you know, uh, things like that. Uh, one of my notes here says the look on the judge's face as Johnny Depp goes on about his love of Hunter S. Thompson and gonzo journalism. That was funny. She, she had this look on her face like she had her eyebrows up like, what? <laughs> what are we talking about? His text messages. He says he is embarrassed and shamed that uh, in his moment of pain and what he was feeling... He went to some dark places. He says he uses dark humor to deal with pain and tends to be very expressive in his writing. On his substance use, he said it goes back to when he was a young boy. He watched his mother take pills to calm down. When he was 11, he wanted to calm down. He didn't know how, so he took them to escape caring and feeling so much, to escape the chaotic nature of what he was living through. He said as kids, they would say things like, let's go party. He says he's taken substances over the years to numb himself of the ghosts that are still with him from his youth as a form of self-medication. Uh, he says Amber Heard gross, grossly embellished his use of substances. He said he had periods of sobriety, like when he was filming Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. The film calls for them to be high constantly, but he said that that wasn't actually, that wasn't actually uh, the case. He said that it would be impossible for them to have filmed that if he and the other actors were actually high. Uh, he said he was sober also for Donnie Brasco, and he never used while on film sets. Uh, he When he was with Amber Heard and friends drinking wine and him smoking pot, they teased him for his ludicrous tolerance because he appeared he never appeared loaded or high even if he felt uh a, a little bit uh spinny he said no one would have known um he talked about being addicted to roxy's uh an opiate he said it was prescribed to him after an injury on the set of pirates four uh, started taking Roxy's and was quote unquote bit by the snake of uh, opiate addiction. He says you don't take them to get high. Once addiction has grabbed hold of you, if you are without them, your body goes into withdrawal. He didn't like being dependent on a drug. Uh, he says now there is a huge fentanyl problem. He says junkies looking for the first high again up the stakes and take more and more. He said it's um. Oh, an audience member sneezed and Johnny Depp said, bless you. <laughs> he calls detox hell pure horror. In 2008, Johnny Depp and Hunter Thompson were going through his manuscripts. They came across the rum diaries. Uh, Hunter was shocked. He found it. He said, this is a movie. Hunter committed suicide at one point. Uh, Johnny thought um, when he saw Amber Heard after she had auditioned several times and he met her, he said, quote, she could definitely kill me. That's what Hunter would want, unquote. He talked about this, t this scene in the movie, this kiss in the shower that he, to him, he said was more than uh, acting and apparently it was for her as well. He talked about her friend Io that was born female but chose to at a young age to be a male amber also was bisexual or gay amber's friend um uh io uh needed a place to stay so she could write a book and johnny depp put her up at one of his uh, beach houses he let her live there for over a year rent free so that kind of concluded um that day's testimony he went on to testify for uh, another, you know, another day, um, another full day. I don't want to get into and read this sort of word for word. Uh, on day seven, at 8, 11 a.m., people were already lining the halls, waiting to get in to see Johnny Depp testify. There was a woman sitting across from me on a laptop. I remember that uh, distinctly. Um, Mr. Rottenborn uh, was on cross with Johnny. He said things like, you know, 
don't you agree abuse can take many forms so you know already sort of backing off of this idea that um potentially amber was physically abused you know i thought it was an interesting thing to open with that abuse can take many forms uh he talked about how oh isn't it true that your your father actually punched you in the face and knocked you down so you know your dad did occasionally uh engage in sort of abuse you know you said that uh he was a gentleman blah 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 they talked about uh, Paul Bettany, a close friend of Johnny Depp's who he did cocaine and drank alcohol with. Now, this day, um, what he was doing, uh, a rotten born, was he was going back and forth, like, in time. He would bring up text messages from, like, 2013. Then he'd bring up an email from 2015. Then we'd go back in time. We're talking about something that happened in 2012. And, uh, you know, I think what he was trying to do was sort of paint this picture regarding Johnny Depp's colorful use of language in his text messages. You know, in, in one text message, he called Amber a witch, talked about burning her and having sex with her corpse. Um, it seemed like it was a joke. You know, when you're looking at this stuff, like, it's obvious he's not being serious, but I think that was her attorney's strategy. They talked about Elton John trying to get him sober. Um, at one point, Johnny Depp called Amber a filthy whore in a text message. There were texts about his use of drugs like ecstasy, MDMA, and cocaine. They talked about Marilyn Manson. They kept bringing him up and saying, oh, didn't you go on a bender with him? Johnny said he gave him a pill once so he would stop talking so much. When he said that, the, the whole room kind of broke out into laughter there um let's see um they talked about uh when he was filming um you know he hit a um a documentary about keith richards he had apparently had a fight with amber heard and accused her of cheating on him um Rottenborn asked about his sister's concerns about his drug use. Johnny says his sister seemed to be a concerned sister in every way. You know, one juror uh, takes copious notes, another looks perpetually surprised. <laughs> yeah, that one has a look on his face that's always like, you know, like that. Uh, like, sort of like wide-eyed or something. I thought that was interesting. Um... You know, one of the things I had noticed here was that there was nothing uh, in this that talked about um, abuse, uh, about him abusing Amber Heard and any of this. They're just talking about his colorful writing and sort of things like that. Um, at one point, uh, it's it says here in my notes that the judge appeared to be getting annoyed with Depp's defense team. Um it appeared, uh, you know, when, when they were making objections to certain things. Uh, there is a point when Johnny Depp looks right at me, and then we went to lunch after that. There were less people uh, after lunch. I think a lot of people left um, and went home because they were really bored with the way that um, Rottenborn was handling the cross-examination. I thought that was, uh, you know, it's like, well, what did you expect? <laughs> right uh this is how it is um i do have in my notes here that there is a very attractive uh sheriff that is in the courtroom each day i refer to him as sexy cop he was there again that day <laughs> okay so uh yeah this was basically some of the the things that i noticed um from that day uh it, it just things like that you know unfortunately I, I wish i could provide more um insight uh, one thing i did notice was that johnny depp texts like a boomer like with all capitals <laughs> at certain times uh which i thought was kind of funny but uh i'm not gonna sit here and give a um play by play of everything that happened on each day you guys can look at that yourself but i will say that when the psychiatrist um was testifying about Amber Heard's diagnosis of borderline personality disorder and histrionics. That was something that uh, not only the audience, but the jury seemed to be interested in as well, that, that testimony. And it's not, I don't think it's surprising 
Um, Amber, you know, when, when this woman was up on the stand uh, testifying, Amber seemed to be uh, obviously uh, upset you know about what this woman was saying so um you know there were there was another gentleman uh i forget his name now uh the scottish um gentleman who worked for johnny depp uh at one point as like a personal assistant i think um when he he was appearing by video he um had people uh, kind of laughing uh, at a couple points as well so i think it will be interesting uh I'm sure, I don't know if she's going to testify on Monday when a uh, trial resumes, but I do believe she's going to be taking the stand soon. I think she's going to testify, and I think it should be very interesting to see how she handles that. Um, because I don't think things have been going well for her or her legal team. I think that her uh, female attorney, Elaine, is very comes off as very abrasive and um, somebody that just, uh, she's not likable, I guess. <laughs> she comes off as very aggressive and um, I don't want to say cunning. That's not the word, but maybe perhaps manipulative. Like, I think that's how she appears. Um, and I think that that's, you know, you have to, when you're, a lawyer and you're you're coming up with like a strategy i think you have to be very careful about how you're perceived by people and i don't think that she i don't think that people have a very good perception of her so i don't think she's done herself any favors um you know and the, and the same could be said for rottenborn as well there were a couple times uh in his uh, cross-examination of Johnny Depp, where he was obviously getting frustrated uh, and annoyed, and you could kind of see that, um, and I think that that uh, detracted a little bit from what he was trying to do with his strategy, uh, and I think that that kind of um, didn't go well. So I don't think that it's going well for Amber Heard at all. I'm not sure uh, how how it's going to play for her when she gets up on the stand now, uh, because all of the evidence so far seems to go in Johnny Depp's favor. It seems to, um, you know, confirm his story, uh, and, and his story hasn't changed. It's been consistent, and, it, and the evidence appears to back that up that we've seen so far. Um, you know, we haven't seen any real uh, evidence of him abusing Amber Heard. We've heard recordings and things that she took that, by the way, reflect very badly on her. When they were playing the recording of him vomiting in the bathroom, I was looking at other people uh, it, that were in the uh, other spectators, right, that were in the courtroom, and people did not, like, that didn't go well for her. People were like, why... Why was she recording this? Why did she record this and save this? You know, that was when he was detoxing uh, and at like the worst po point of his life, at the lowest point. And this is someone, this is her husband who she's supposed to love. And she is surreptitiously recording him vomiting and then saving that recording. There was another, uh, the last um, couple minutes of his cross Johnny Depp's cross examination where they played a recording where he was talking about you know, ha asking Amber to cut him with a knife or something. You know, I think that they thought that was going to go well for them. It didn't. That did not go well for Amber Heard or, or her lawyers. That did not, uh, Johnny Depp got very emotional. He looked like he was about to cry or something as he listened to this. And people were sympathizing with him. Nobody was listening to that and thinking, Oh, yeah, you know, he's, what a bad guy. No, people felt bad for him. Um, so that didn't go well for them. I hope I can have some more uh, insight for you guys from inside the courtroom, um, trying to observe things that you won't be able to see, wouldn't be able to see uh, unless you're inside the courtroom because the cameras are not going to show you the faces of the jury. They can't, obviously. You can't see the judge's reactions to a lot of things or things that happen on morning break, on lunch break, you know, at the end of the day, in the afternoon break, things like that. You know, that's where I think I've gotten some of the more interesting insights, you know, listening to people 
on lunch break talk about like how they think things are going or what what stood out to them you know there was one lady <laughs> when Johnny Depp was talking about his uh his uh, family like his abusive family and how that sort of like colored the way that he dealt with his relationship with Amber Heard that this older woman was like in tears and she says when I look at him I see a broken man you know you you wouldn't know that unless you were there uh, in person and I thought that was an interesting thing like if if she's thinking that I wonder if other people are thinking that as well so just um that's the kind of thing i'll try to provide i won't be doing the daily like st updated articles or anything like that because it's just too much work for me and it's so oversaturated there's so many other people doing that what i will try to do is i will try to on lunch break um pop in on other channels like legal bites if i can and um you know just kind of provide my perspective from being inside the courtroom there and then i'll try to make more videos like this so hopefully you guys found that interesting i guess and we'll see what happens i want i'm interested to see amber heard on the stand and if she tries to cry or how she handles this because guys i don't think she's a good actress i i don't i don't think so at all and you know we know she has a temper we know she has borderline personality disorder we know she does the histrionics so you don't know how she's going to react to certain things if she blows up. But I will say there were several days there where I made eye contact with her. And um, it seemed to me that she was like sedated or she's like medicated. So maybe they have her on some kind of mood stabilizer or something like that. But uh, yeah, we'll see what happens uh, next week.